Every semester, students at SDU deliver excellent assignments on various topics. They demonstrate that they have the relevant skills needed to analyze questions of relevance to researchers and business practitioners. In 2021, students worked on an assignment that aimed to explain what motivates firms to trade with or invest in specific foreign markets. In the following, we will present findings from five student assignments at SDU using quantitative research methods. This assignment is provided by Alina, Joshua, Till, Philip and Morton. They analyze the relationship between institutional factors and foreign market entry. In their assignment, they demonstrate the relevance of regulatory institutions above and beyond other institutional factors. Uh, welcome to our presentation about the relationship between institutional factors and foreign market entry. To explain this relationship, we performed a factor and regression analysis. Let's have a look at our approach. So first, we did a literature review to understand the relation between institutional factors and inward FDI. Secondly, we built up hypotheses on the, ba on the basis of Bailey from 2018 and Holmes of 2013 on a global level of analysis for the 193 United Nations countries. Third, we collected and determined variables influencing inward FDI and bundled the variables into factors. And with these factors, we performed a regression analysis and tried to improve the regression models with other variables. And in the end, we state our conclusion, state the limitations of our work, and recommend further research. Looking at the literature review, there are several factors influencing FDI, for example, democratic institutions like civil liberties, political stability, so the uh, honesty of, of the government, rule of law, corruption, tax rates, uh, cultural distance, also regulatory institutions in terms of the trade policy, political institutions, economic institutions, in terms of inflation or GDP per capita. And Holmes and Bailey um, built several hypotheses. So the relationship between institutional factors and FDI will be stronger in developing countries than in developed countries. The relationship between institutional factors and FDI will be the strongest in Asia, followed by North America and then Europe. Regulatory institutions exercising greater control over organization activities are negatively related to inward FDI, and democratic political institutions are positively related to inward FDI. Regarding the sample, we've extended the sample size of homes from 50 countries to the 193 member states of the United Nations. Initially, we planned to include 28 variables into our analysis, but ended up with only using 15 of them. Coming to the measurements, similar to homes, we've included economic, regulatory and political variables from a variety of sources such as the World Bank, KPMG, Transparency International, Wharton School of Business from University of Pennsylvania, the Index of Economic Freedom, the Institute for Economics and Peace, the Property Rights Alliance, and the Freedom House. What we can see is that there are some missing values for certain variables, especially for stocks traded. And we are going to test three hypotheses in our analysis, and they are stated as follows. The first one, regulatory, political, and economic factors influence FDI inflow. The second, the relationship between inward FDI and regulatory factors is the st strongest. And the third one, low income levels have a high have a positive influence on inward FDI. Starting now with the factor analysis, and in step one, we formulate the problem. We've conducted a confirmatory factor analysis, and we expected that our chosen variables are going to be assigned to a regulatory, political, or economic factor. In step two, computing and testing the correlation matrix, in our first model, the matrix is not positive definite, and therefore we removed variables. In the, in the second model, the KMO was below the threshold of 0 0.5, and also we could recognize weak MSA value values. Therefore, we removed variables again. And in our third model, 
we came over the, above the threshold of 0 0.5 and all MSA values were above the threshold of 0 0.5 as well. And therefore we continued in our analysis with model 3. Okay, so what is the first thing to have a look at when scanning the SPSS output of the factor analysis? The answer is quite simple. Start right at the top. There we can find the results of the kaiser meyer orkin test. But why is this the first important table worth considering? The KMOS is a helpful tool that indicates whether the variables we use for the factor analysis, our data, are actually suitable for conducting a factor analysis. We simply have to check whether the parameter in the upper right corner is higher than 0 0.5. Our 0 0.8 is above the threshold. Perfect. So we are good to move on. This next table is our final anti-image matrix. It took some trial and error to stepwise remove and add the variables that led to parameters above the threshold of 0 0.5. What do these numbers in the diagonal tell us? With the KMO, we just knew that overall the variables we used were adequate for effect analysis, but we did not know which ones exactly and if there were some variables less suitable. The parameters in the diagonal are called measures of sampling adequacy. Values above 0 0.8 indicate that the variables work very good for effect analysis, whereas variables with 0 0.5 or less might need to be removed from the analysis. So, all our variables are acceptable. Perfect. Now we have to look at the total variance explained. The first thing to strike the eye is that there are only three rows that are completely filled. We immediately know that SPSS grouped our variables into three factors. Yay! That is exactly what we wanted. But we will also check if these three factors can explain most of the variance that all variables in the video could explain. We find that information in the last column loading's cumulative percentage, marked in the blue box. The three factors that SPSS created out of our 10 variables explain a little over 75% of the total variance. That's great! We also indicated three other values within the blue dotted box. They tell us that factor 1 and 2 it can explain almost 30% of the total variance, whereas the third factor only explains 15%. Finally, we can identify which variables were grouped into which factor. In the rotated component matrix, we can quickly check which variables have the highest correlation with the individual factors. The first column represents the first factor, the second, the second, and so on. We can see that six variables were grouped to factor 1 and that two variables were grouped for factor 2 and factor 3 respectively. As a next step, we have to go through the variables and check whether they were grouped according to the factors we initially had in mind. Unfortunately, SPSS did not group the factors that we initially planned, as you can see in this table. We still try to stick with the headlines, economic, political and regulatory, from the reviewed literature so that we would be able to answer hypotheses. However, if we had more time, we would have named the findings differently. For all variables now grouped under regulatory, for example, we thought they might also indicate the status of development of a country. Nevertheless, we had to keep on one eye closed to further proceed with the hypothesis testing. We will now use the regulatory, the political and economic and see how much they explain the dependent value of the iron flow. In the model summary table, we can see that our R square value is 0 0.082, and we can therefore conclude that our three independent variables explain 8.2% of the dependent variable. Um, furthermore, we can see that in the NOVA test, that there is a p value of 0 0.001, and we can therefore conclude there is a significant correlation between the dependent and independent values. In the coefficient model, we see that factor 2, political, is not significant and does not statistically significantly affect the FDI inflow. We also identify that both factor 1, regulatory, and factor 3, economic, with an alpha level of 0 0.05, are significant. Um, the beta value shows that factor 1 has a positive effect on the FDI inflow, and factor 3 has a negative effect on the FDI inflow. We removed factor 2 because it was significant and we ran the test again with the two significant variables. In the new model summary we see that the air square value still is a 0 0.082 um, but the adjusted air square value increased to 0 0.072. So still the two independent variables explain 8.2% of the FDI inflow.
Um, in the new ANOVA, we have a p-value of 0, which again confirms that there is a significant correlation between the dependent and independent outputs. Um, to check for the multicontinuity, we looked at the statistics with and saw a value of 1.001, for both which is lower than the critical value of 5, and we can therefore conclude there is no multicontinuity in the data. Now we're going to have a look at the reduced model and test for homoscedastic error terms. We can see in the plot here that there's clearly a pattern in the residuals and the error terms of our data, and that indicates that there's heteroscedastic error terms, which is a breach in the Gauss-Markov assumption for ordinary least square regression. Um, we can see that there's a clear pattern, and that indicates that there's lacking variables to explain our dependent variable, which is the FDI. This breach in assumption isn't totally bad for the joint model. It, however, artificially decreases p-values, so we need to be kind of careful when choosing the p-values um, when evaluating the joint significance of our model. But uh, as was introduced earlier at a significance level of 5%, the model is both jointly significant as well as the, the two independent variables in the reduced model. Now we will have a look at the reduced model and test for the distribution of the error terms. Due to a sample size of 193 countries, which exceeds the number of 50, we apply a Kolmogorov-Smirnov test to evaluate the normality of the error terms. As indicated here, by a p-value of below 0, it rejects the null hypothesis and indicates that we have non-normal error terms. We decided to investigate this by performing a box plot. You can see this on the right-hand side. In this graph, we found that observation 57 and 192 are very extreme outliers, and we experimented with excluding these very extreme values. Anyhow, also when excluding these, we would have non-normal data, according to Kolmogorov of Smirnov. Um, we anyhow accept to continue with our testing with a slight breach in this assumption because we argue that the large sample size of 193 countries of a population of 193 countries means that the central limit theorem applies and at our chosen significance level we accept this slight breach in assumption. Now we need to look at the third hypothesis, the income level on the FDI. And what we've done to this reduced model we had before, we now, as uh, argued earlier, we entered the GDP for measuring income level, and we see that that model has a lower adjusted R square than the reduced model, and it's nevertheless jointly significant. When we, however, look at the uh, underlying independent variables, we see that GDP per capita is highly insignificant. Therefore, statistically, we cannot infer that income level has a significant influence on inward FDI. And within the setting of our joint model, we reject our hypothesis and exclude GDP, and we remain just keeping the two-factor scores as independent constructs. Let's have a look at our conclusion. So our first hypothesis, uh, regulatory, political, and economic factors influence FDI inflow. We need to reject this hypothesis because the political factor is not significant. Only the regulatory factor and the economic factor have a significant impact on FDI inflow. The second hypothesis, the relationship between inward FDI and regulatory factors, is the strongest. We can confirm this with a standardized coefficient of 0.236. The relation between the regulatory factor and inward FDI is the strongest followed by the economic factor with a standardized coefficient of minus 0.154, so it influences FDI inflow in a negative way. And looking at the third hypothesis, low income level has a, in, has a positive influence on inward FDI, we also need to reject this hypothesis because the income level is not significant. And let's have a look at our limitations and further research implications. Limitations, uh, we had missing values for several countries, especially for stocks traded within the country. There was a problem in developing countries. Our error terms show a pattern, so therefore there are some variables explaining inward FDI, but we haven't mentioned them. And the regression model explains 8.2% of the variance of inward FDI in United Nations countries, um, but that is in the frame of other research. So for further research, we recommend to discover additional variables explaining the inward FDI in United Nations states.
and search for institutions or other factors which have a high influence on FTI. So therefore the error terms can be explained and the uh, regression model can explain a higher variance. Thank you for your attention. And this is our literature. I hope you enjoyed watching. Feel free to get in touch in the case of any questions.